Hey guys, today we're going to do some detective work because this is a mystery PPK that's going to be going into the vault. Okay, today I want to spend a little bit of time on this Walder PPK uh, as brand new in the box. A serial number dates it to about 1940. I want to open this up and dissect it a little bit because there were some things in this box that didn't make any sense to me. And the more I study it, the more they begin to make sense. Come on over. Okay, to start off, this is the typical box for a wartime um, PPK. Now, all of them, all the boxes looked about like this, but there are different kinds of labels. There was a bow tie label, there was an oval uh, label that was hand numbered. Uh, my favorites and the, the most prominent are the green label boxes. So if somebody says I have an original Walder box with the green label, this is the green label variation. The reason I like this better is the earlier variations were hand numbered in here. So again, there would be a bow tie label that uh, was often written in pencil or in ink. And then there was the oval label. Uh, often written in pencil or ink. Now, if it was written in pencil, it's fairly easy for somebody to erase the number. So, for example, if you have a party leader, uh, well, actually, an early one, you take a RZM, uh, you erase the numbers and write in the num new numbers, uh, then you'd have a matching box. So, the reason collectors like these better, and they actually command a premium price, is because these are obviously pre-printed. Also, the font is very unusual. I've talked to people who do, um, do a lot of printing, and this is very hard to replicate. Uh, I have seen people try it. I know, f I know for sure this is all original. I've, I've seen probably 40, 50 of these, and this is an original green label. Uh, we also open it up, and I see a capture paper. Uh, that this went to John Howard, and there is his GI number. It has the serial number of the gun, but unfortunately, it's off by a little bit. You see um, 289, 289, but up here is 157, and down here is 254. Now, we're going to look into that. that. That seems devastating at first, but eh, it's not that bad. Uh, the uh, serial number dates it to 1940, and sure enough, we open up. This is an original manual, and the place, that, the place where they are dated is on the back, and this is February of 1940, so this is no doubt the original manual. Uh, we also have a 1940 cleaning cut. The, uh, cleaning cut? Uh, we have a 1940 cleaning kit. Uh, the Walder banner only is the correct wartime. Uh, the one before this had a picture of the factory, um, and that was for the earlier gun. When we take this off, they're all about the same. Uh, this has the cellophane. This is the original uh, like rag they would use for the bore, and this is the original bottle with just a little bit of oil, actually not much left, but oil, an oiler, and the rag. These are original and correct. Uh, we also have a spare magazine. It, uh, typically, uh, the commercial guns came with a, a finger extension mag. Randy will get that shot. And then a flat bottom. We'll take that out. And then the gun itself. Now, this gun really pops. Brand new. Uh, I'd say it's 99.8%. A uh, little bit of wear right here and here. It, it looks like it was in a holster a few times. Uh, here you can see the fire blue is, is uh, almost perfect. Uh, the other side uh, is uh, Eagle N. And again, 1940, it's correct to be Eagle N. And then you see the serial number, which matches the capture paper, but not the box. If uh, your eyes can dart between those three numbers, you can see the box is not quite right, but these go together. So the first question, there's a lot of questions that pop into my mind, and some of you are thinking, hey, Tom, what the heck are you doing here? First and foremost, the RZM variation most commonly are found in the 800,000 range from 1934 into 1935. So basically, I think 802 XXX, uh, was among the first ones made, and I think the last ones were about 850. Uh, 
the 850,000 zero range. And they were all 90 degree safeties and they were all crown end proof. But in 1940, there was an order of what I would conjecture, there was an order of about 300 of these guns uh, that were made during the war. So if you, many people, and somebody just wrote to me today, I'm looking for an early RZM, really hard to find. They don't come up very often. Um, the prices have been in the $3,000 to $4,000 range, but there were 30,000 of those made and they went to party members. Party members would order them. 30,000 party members ordered the RZM PPK and they were delivered. But in 1940, they only made, well, they, they had a separate contract for 300. Now let's take a look at that contract. So I took a, a portion of my database. I have about tw uh, 20,000 uh, serial numbers. And um, as I mentioned, there's 30,000 in a solid block of 30,000 in 1934. But then in 1940, we see this serial range. Now there's only 17 guns here and one box. It is a solid block if you only look at the PPKs. Um, and however, there's, you can see there's uh, two. Two out of 17 were PPs. So if we do the math, we'll say it's about 10%. And this block is about 340 guns long. And if we take off, uh, take off about uh, not quite, not exactly 10%, but we take off about 10%. Just stick with me here. Those of you who hate statistics, we can figure out a lot by just looking at a sample size. So in this block of about 300 guns, there were some PPs. But it, otherwise, it was a solid block of RZMs. I would stake my life on it. So this is where the research part of it comes in. Those of you people say, well, I, I do a lot of research. I collect the data. This is why the data is so important. So for example, if I wanted to know how many people in the United States have blue eyes, I don't have to survey the entire United States. This is a no-brainer. Of course, you get a sample size of 5,000 people, and then you extrapolate out. So what I see here is there's a, about 300 guns right in this range uh, that were, all were a part of a contract for party leaders. Now, when I started collecting, so 30 years ago, but certainly 20 years ago, I used to pick up guns directly from the vets all the time. Now, not so much. They, they have died, that generation has died off, or they no longer are, um, you know, selling their own guns because they're in a nursing home, and now the family is selling off the guns. And often when I say, where did this come from, they'll say, well, I don't know, Pops never really talked about it. But when I used to buy a boxed gun, I would always say, where did this come from? And the most uh, common answer was, uh, we, we went into this police station, and we found a storage closet and right up here there was a boxes of guns and me and all my buddies just grabbed one. Now that, that makes sense because uh, for all you cops out there, you know, and it, it just logically, if your township just issued the new Sig Sauer to, uh, uh, as your carry piece, they gave it to you and, in a box and maybe you kept the box in your locker for a little bit of time. But generally, you know, like a month later, the box is long gone because now you just carry the gun. The only box guns that would still be in, you know, in the box, in the closet, would be an unissued gun. And so that's why and I had one, uh, one situation where there were three consecutive numbered police guns. So three box consecutive number guns that were brought back uh, to the United States from Germany. So this contract, obviously they ordered 300, maybe they only needed 200, and the remainder went into the closet. So uh, th what, what that tells me is that this gun and this box, while they don't match, they were in the same contract. They were in the same closet because what are the chances? Yeah, basically, um, if you look at it as if it's a solid block, this could not be any, this serial number can't be anything but an RZM. If you, again, go back and look at the database, it can't be anything other than at one point it had an RZM in it. And so because there's a little bit of holster wear, maybe uh, somebody took it out, they used it a little bit, they took it, uh, they took it out for target practice, put it back in the box. Somewhere along the line, the box and the gun got mixed up. But they were in the same contract and I would be willing to bet they were taken out of the same drawer or the same closet by 
John Howard. Now, let's talk a little bit about John Howard because this is the other controversy that some of you really smart people were saying, wait a minute, check this out. Okay, so here's the capture paper, John Howard. Now, first of all, the font looks wrong. Some of you picked that out right away. And this looks too, too new. However, um, okay, I'll give one accommodation. If this was folded up and kept in the box, then uh, you know, I believe it could, it could actually look this nice. But normally they were folded up and put in a wallet and they're torn and tattered, more like, more like this one. And this is the font that I'm used to. Uh, actually, I'm gonna show you several different fonts. And these are orphan uh, capture papers, meaning there's no gun to go with it, there's no reason to fake them. Um, but when I saw this, and by the way, I bought this from a guy up in upstate New York, and I asked him where he got it, and he said he got it uh, some years ago. It was probably around uh, 2016, 2017. Uh, he picked this up from an estate sale. So they went to an estate sale. They bought this gun with the accessories, with this capture paper, and one other piece. It also came with this. And we'll talk about that next because that's another mystery. But let's set that aside and focus on the capture paper. So we see the two, the font there is different than the font here. The best way to see a two here is down here. And they're actually pretty close. But this is what I'm used to when I look at capture papers. This is the font that I'm used to. And there's no question these, these are legit because it's the typewriter of the time. But yet this font too and this font too are completely different. So that, that makes me think, well, I, I don't know. I guess they had more than one typewriter. That's logical. And here's a third one. Look at this two versus this two versus this two. We got th three different twos and this is just the ones that I pulled out of my drawer today. And now we add this one. So I went from, and again, you have to look down here at the two. I went from, and in fact, I, I told the guy who offered to sell it to me, I said, I definitely like the gun. I definitely like the box. No question, 100% real. I did tell him I don't like the font on, the, on these certificates. But since I've had it, I began to look at it a little bit and say, you know what? It's, it, it may not be right, but then again, it might. There was more than one font. So then the next question is, okay, John Howard, and there's his number. Does he actually exist? Okay, so with the help of my dad, my dad looks people up on the internet. He started by looking up his classmates. He's 95 years old and he looks up his classmates and then the year before and then guys that went off to the war that he never saw again, he looked them up. And so uh, with his skills of looking people up, he found John Howard. We know for a fact this is the right one. Um, he was born in 1919, which puts him at 24, 25 when he captured this gun at the end of the war. Again, probably taken out of a closet of a party, uh, a party building or a party headquarters. Um, he was skilled mechanics and he was in the Signal Corps, by the way. Syracuse, New York um, was where he enlisted. He was from upstate New York. And there is his service number, which matches this. So I just got this from my dad uh, yesterday. Actually, yeah, I printed it out this morning. Uh, he looked it up yesterday. Um, and by the way, he died in 2016, and he had a sister that was still living up there. Now, uh, where he is buried is um, in Cayuga, New York. He was buried. The man who got, I got this from, uh, I wrote him a check, and I mailed it to Auburn, uh, New York. Uh, Randy just went to Google Map and, and looked up how far is it from Cayuga to Auburn. It's 15 minutes away. So he obviously bought this from the family of the vet. I thought that this was wrong, but the more I research it, I think it's possible that this is real. It looks almost too good to be true. The font is a little bit different, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say guarantee 100% real. I will tell you this guaranteed 100% real. That is the real box and a real RZM PPK in pristine condition. Now, let's take a look at this holster because this is the other thing. When I saw this and this, I said, okay, this is not possible and this is not possible. Now I'm saying, this is possible, so what about this? 
Those of you who watch my channel, you know that a party leader, Aka Holster, is supposed to look like this. It has a couple distinct characteristics. The, most, uh, the one that uh, we all focus on is the eagle. And I looked at both eagles pretty, pretty closely. It looks pretty good. It has the right amount of wear, but also everybody will say the rule is it has to be, it is squared off at the top because that way it doesn't cover the eagle. If it has the half moon, it covers up the swastika and they wouldn't do that. So, uh, by the way, this is not for sale. This is also from the vault by itself, not for sale. Some of you are already typing, Tom, how much do you want? Not for sale. It would take me 10 years to find another one of these, so I'm not going to sell it. Uh, but this is, this is the way they came, and there is a catalog from 1938 and 1939. There is an Aka catalog where you could order one of these. So the first time they show up is 1938, and you see them um, up through 1939, and then generally you don't see them again. So we know they existed. We know they were for sale. I forgot what the original price was. We did a video on it at one point. Now, every once in a while, you'll see an RZM. We know the RZM from 1934 that I talked about. Every once in a while, you'll see a party leader holster with a 1934 RZM. And what I know from that is the gun was made in 34. This holster was not a part of it. But in 1938, the catalog came out, and this was available, and I had uh, 20 Reichsmarks, or actually this would have been, <laughs> the gun was about 20. This is probably about five or six Reichsmarks, and I decided I'm going to go get me one and put it with my RZM. Now, what about this? Okay, this could be completely fake. But the more I looked at it, I look inside here, and it's pretty worn off. But here I see the word John. I see the F. There's no F here. So how did they know his name was John F? Because going back to the information my father has, it's John F. I don't know about you, but I'm getting goosebumps right now. This is his handwriting, and that's his GI number. It's barely visible, but that is John F. Howard. Now, the other thing that you'll see is you see an RZM and the date 1941. So, who made this? There is no maker. I know a couple collectors out there, their heads are about to explode because they're going to say, Tom, Aka was the only contract for these party leader. They, no one else was allowed to make them. Well, I guess if you find the order um, from the... Uh, RZM Bureau that no one else is allowed to make them, but I'm learning something today, and that is I don't know everything. I can't swear to you this is 100% correct, but I am telling you it gives me pause because everything I thought about party leader holsters does not jive with this holster. But this holster came with this gun brought back by John Howard, and I'll tell you one other thing. When I, when I said I would buy all of this, he said, oh, by the way, it came with a holster. I'll throw it in. So <laughs> if somebody wanted to fake it uh, and to make more money, uh, it didn't help a whole lot. So uh, this is just, a in my opinion, it's a phenomenal find. And guess what? I'm not done. I'm going to keep researching this. I want to find out a little bit more about John and his service and how this all came together, uh, the font. Uh, there's more to learn here, and let me just clarify one thing. I am not, you know, this, well, this reminds me of the old saying, how do you know whether something is real or fake? The answer is, if somebody else owns it, it's fake. But once I own it, now it's real. And that's kind of what's going on here. So I just want to tell you, I'm, I'm skeptical, uh, but I'm researching it, and I wanted to share it with you because it, I think it's very, very cool. And in fact, it does give me goosebumps. Okay, this is what is called the outro. I did the intro, now's an outro, and I can't think of a better outro, certainly not looking at my face, but let's just take a, another look at this. Notice it's frosted in the background. That's exactly right. Notice the fire blue. Notice the red dot. Notice the Walder banner. Notice the finish, how uh, almost like a royal blue that you would see on a, a Colt Python. Uh, no crack back here. There's some... Uh, there's some coloring there, but no crack here, no crack around here, 
Here's the magazine. It's a wartime magazine, which a uh, early RZM would have just the banner only. This is the correct magazine, as is this one. Take a look at the other side. The eagle ends are in there very crisp. If I ran my finger over it, I can feel it. the raising of the metal. It has never been buffed. It's not been refinished. You see the fire blue here. Uh, you see how beautiful this is. Just an incredible find. Uh, if I had a time machine, this is what it would have looked like the day it left the factory.